Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Don Sakya, and we are still on site in Boston, Massachusetts. This is now our third episode featuring Core's number one question asker, Alex K. Chen. What's up, man? Hey, what's up, what's up? Thanks for coming on to the show. Hey, yeah, yeah. For the third time. The second mm -hmm. time in Boston. You came on the show in San Francisco last time. No, the first, yeah, the first was Boston. Oh yeah, because the first time we were in summer. Yeah. Summer, yeah, yeah. Which is in the Boston area. So twice in the Boston area, which has been good. And we're having Alex on for the third time because our conversations with Alex are, they're multidisciplinary. They're super pushing the cutting edge of knowledge. Which well, is I'm a just lot very, fun. very meta. Alex is better. Yeah, that's right. You are. I like that a lot. And I like how you are, again, pushing the cutting edges of knowledge a lot. And that's what we want to talk about in this episode. And I love thinking about things in terms of like a ring of cutting edge knowledge and that there's humanity, civilization has evolved to know certain things, this collective learning. And the collective learning's been pushed to this ring, but there's things in the unknown in the outsides of the ring, and Alex likes to live, and I do too a lot, on that outside of that ring, trying to scrape and find more information. So tell us about why you're so passionate about that. Um, edginess, I just know that being that good things are likely to happen to you more often if you just do edgy things. You also are more likely to stay relevant over time. And if you're if you stay relevant over time, um, it basically means that people more uh, people more willing to pay attention to you or things you touch, and and also it helps you basically adapt to a world that is constantly changing. Yeah, staying relevant, you can actually adapt more in a world that's changing. If you stay edgy, you're not in the sort of conformist area that so many other people fall into. It's nice to stay on the edge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, keep going on, on, on edginess. I think if you're constantly edgy, you're also more likely to discover facts about yourself or the world that allow you to escape um, local maxima that people somehow have a tendency to stick to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's almost as though there's a... Uh, constantly pushing the the boundaries of what is is being discussed in the conversations that you have is is actually will get you much further and it'll get the overall collective learning that's going on in that circle further yeah hmm okay so how do you push the edge um so I will acknowledge that I'm not I'm I'm not as good as at it as I could be. Um, of course, this is true for all other people. I think exposing myself to new ideas and people from all the time, um, especially in different domains, um, and also just like figure out the, stimu uh, the stimuli or people that help you maximize your learning rate per unit of time, since um, there is like a very specific type of pattern information that basically optimizes your learning rate or optimize your experiencing rate. And it, it has to like, there's a relationship between all the knowledge you have and, and whatever knowledge that optimizes that, that rate is. And oftentimes being there uh, where, um, where you, you can't have everything basically thrown at you is one way to, um, to basically be in it. For example, um, oftentimes the fastest, when you're talking to someone, the fastest learning rates uh, when talking to someone are like when you're in, crowded multi-dimensional settings um, or like settings where you know other people and then you see and you basically watch um, it's like there's a lot of information that, that's, that's basically covered uh, that that you can basically like kind of figure out even if you, you can literally map it semantically you, you, um, you, you, you just notice and observe those over time so basically like um, the more stimuli the faster learning rate mm. okay so optimizing learning rate for yourself and others I like that a lot. So yeah. there's, there, we've talked about this before on the show, uh -huh. but it's so sad that we'll never be able to know everything. Well, who knows, yeah. brain computer yeah. interfaces, maybe we'll be tied into everything uh, soon. But what does, for you, what does it mean then to optimize that rate of learning specifically 
for you. You started kind of pointing and uh, and touching at it, and it we have the limitation in just eighty years of time. So we got to figure out what environments, what people yeah. we should surround ourselves with, what information areas on the internet should we surround ourselves with so start talking so about i think that. areas that i'm going to say relevance those have recurring relevance and um oftentimes um like those that um the areas so basically i used the areas i used to be attracted to are aren't areas and most people want to learn unfortunately because they're not relevant to most people's lives even though you can't spend entire lifetimes just spending just studying um areas of psychology that are universally relevant to people um though even then most people will not necessarily learn uh if not, um most people are not served best by learning each and every area of that um oftentimes um let's say seeing how you behave in very unusual situations, for example, the type of learning. And then sometimes if you can remember it well enough, it gives you the courage to push through um, other situations where you're not feeling optimal, but you know, but you have the confidence that pushing through will basically lead, uh, good things will happen if you, if you do push, push through. So, so mm -hmm. once you like basically learn of, of that, that kind of confidence, but also um, only learn the, uh, learn the area of confidence in areas where you, um, where you're, uh, re expectations or feedback loops are in such a way that you won't overstretch and burn yourself out. Mm -hmm. Damn, you, you bring up this really important point. You can't really push the, the edge of knowledge of, of humanity without having confidence. You have to have confidence to be able to go and know that even though 99% of people aren't thinking the way you're thinking, that you can still be right, potentially. And you can go and work either with other people or even alone and and aim to push that cutting edge have edgy conversations with people go to edgy places on the internet now oh the edge that's yeah. what the original site yeah that's right the edge.org right yeah, yeah 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 that is it's a good there's a lot of good content there um okay and the only way that we've gotten to where we are today is because humans decided to push the edge over and over across all of the different disciplines and growing the collective learning pool over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what else do you think are some of the, you know, the characteristics or the motivations behind people wanting to do that? Um, I mean, sometimes it's just survival um, because there are environments where you have a large portion of the population that does get wiped out. And though, so for example, even just the Holocaust and um, the people who usually who got out before everyone got wiped out were those who constantly sought out new information about what happened in the world. And they took steps to prepare to move well before the, the scenes actually happened. Damn. So that's as though uh, people can sort of uh, hedge against upcoming threats. Potentially. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh yeah, that's kind of what we see a little bit with the bunkers that were made during the nuclear cold during the Cold War threat. Yeah. Also, it's not just that you also want to be sufficiently valid enough such that people will want you to basically uh, survive through the threats because not um, unfortunately um, not everyone play. It's hard to value every person equally in t in situations of scarcity or survival when everyone else is when everyone else is thinking about surviving themselves. And in these bottleneck events, um, you basically want to figure out how to um, maximize the chance of going through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. Yeah, the, oh, oh, the chances of becoming irrelevant, as you said earlier, you don't want to become irrelevant. You want to survive. You want to survive and you want to flourish, mm -hmm. both. Okay, so in the modern age, now with the abundance of information, the abundance of our ability oh, to Oh yeah, go, oh yeah, it's yeah. like attention is also being followed and more and more attention is, it's like attention is kind of becoming more zip flaw -ish. It's like more attention is going into fear of people, which is why a lot of people are feeling lost and neglected mm. and sad and people often decry this as some sort of, um, so, so widespread social malaise, which in some respects it probably is. Um, but on the other hand, um, if people are if people are kind of are insecure and looking only for themselves, then this is something you might you might see a bit more of. And this is where like skill where the skills that are important for um, for staying valued um, 
include ones like pushing the edge in ways that other people are a little bit too afraid of or yeah. don't have the energy for or um, somehow don't think even think of as possibilities. Yeah. So it's like an, kind of like an upside risk kind of thing. Yeah. And I want to speak a bit more on the the abundance of information is both incredible mm-hmm. and it's also can be at times distractive. Yeah, it can be. Yeah. So talk to us about that. So it's also a matter of when you're pursuing the information and if you are um, archiving it in a way that allows for easy reaccess in the future mm-hmm. and in a way that makes you want to reaccess it into the future. Mm-hmm. So, so the archiving of information. So, okay. So, as you push the the edge of knowledge, and you're, you know, we'll talk a bit more about how how, how you're working with people on that. Mm-hmm. How do you archive information? Um, like internet browser history is an Agoran basically has this tool to scrape um, all the sites in the internet browser history. I don't do it well enough. I'm taking more screenshots on the computer screen these days. And also, um, if, if I think something's gonna be important for someone in the future or for myself or something I want, I want, uh, I want all future people to know I am definitely gonna screenshot it because otherwise there's, no, there's gonna be no way to capture it or bookmark it or, or some sort of low stakes way. Um, though I still, there are still like setting up costs that sometimes get disrupted when you switch platforms, which has happened to many people over the years. Yeah. Okay, so Let's talk about um, Bloom 2 Sigma. Yeah. This is very interesting. So you choose to work on a one-on-one basis. Ideally. Ideally with people at the edge of their fields and just Or people who are just general. ridiculously good at what they're at. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, we like using this analogy of playing a game of tennis. So you're, you know, people that are high openness, you can basically hit them over an interesting idea, tennis ball, and they can hit it back over to you with some added thoughts and you can keep pushing the boundaries of the circle of what is the edge of knowledge. Yeah, yeah, not high openness means not be pre, being in pre-attached to existing thoughts and also always being attentive to adjusting their frame frame in a way that um, basically makes uh, basically makes that thought optimal or figures out better better ways to um, uh, uh, make, make, uh, apply the, optimally apply the knowledge. Mm-hmm. Okay, I like how you talked about adjusting the frame and, and being humble about like basically augmenting your perspective, adding to the lens of which you see the world. Because uh-huh. somebody can always hit you with something that is like, oh, that shatters a way that I saw things before. Yeah, yeah, just not being attached to your, to your general thoughts at all, which means like not being right, not being obsessed with being right all the time, and not, not even putting emotional valence into being right. Mm. So what, how do you not attach emotional valence to being right? I think having and think curiosity about the world, just knowing, uh, having the intense con- conviction that um, you need to operate that way in order to, in order for good things to continue happening uh, to you, or, or whatever you're experiencing in your consciousness, in your conscious frame, basically. Mm. The moment that you attach your emotions to your ideas and 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 your ways of, of thinking and seeing the world, and if someone comes and tries to tries to augment your perspective, and you're so attached to it, you don't see what they're saying. You're you you lose the your opportunity to enhance the way that you see the world. Yeah, there are a lot of weird social incentives and all that people hold to being right the first time, or to uh, or to say. Um, being the first the right answer or just having political views that you don't want to budge from. And it's kind of weird because I'm not sure if it's even all that integrated within, say, their utility functions at all. In, it's actually, uh, I don't know where to put it in terms of utility functions because there seems I mean, to people be ge- important I, times to I be mean, in general, people, in general, people do, uh, people do respect people more if they know that they're right in most fundamental issues. Um, like, Hey, um, if someone tells you, I believe, oh, if, uh, if X, if you say something, I ultimately convince, I, I ultimately think you're, you're right. That's kind of flattering in that, in that way, because, uh, because it also like attaches the notion of value and um, intelligence and all that other stuff. For example, if you were to, to counter my perspective on world peace. I really, uh-huh. I want world peace. I believe in world uh-huh. peace. I believe that we can dose up on love and get to world peace together. And if you are to say it's never gonna happen. 
Right. I stand quite firm on on my on my stance there. I don't I don't want to budge from that. Stance. So what you're saying is a value judgment, not necessarily an epistemic judgment. Okay. Okay. Um, like a political judgment of what sure, you want sure. the future to be. Sure, sure. Um, so then if we're talking like um, um, the, the Earth being the third planet from the star or something mm-hmm. like that, you know, you can't really budge me from that. That's justified truth. That's epistemology. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So then you can't budge me from that, right? Right? Is that what we're... Mostly, yeah. Mostly? Um, I'm not going to go into the huge debates. Okay. All right, all right. Um, hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways to talk about the way to enhance people's perspective in ways that kind of make it so that people don't feel hurt by them saying that I'm wrong or uh, we're, we are quite attached to saying I'm right about things. And it actually does cause a lot of, of, uh, of slowdown in civilizational progress due to due to being attached to the thought of, of wanting to be right. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's talk about this um, Bloom to Sigma. So you pick, you pick people that you really think are open, very high openness, um, low negative emotion. Yeah. And you work with them and on pushing the boundaries of what you know and what they know. Or like you send them a bunch of emails or questions, like what, like what I used to do with Quora. And then sometimes they just reframe it and in a a way that makes it more understandable to you and in a way that makes it easier for you to retrieve it later. Uh, Okay, so so you would you would you would submit your um, when you submit your questions Quora via email. Yeah, I used to. Used to. um, You would uh, have the questions posted and then you would get a people that would reply Mm -hmm. to you Mm -hmm. on Quora um, reframing the question in a way that you thought was potentially better. And also reframe and just answer it in a way that um, that basically updates my knowledge of it. Sometimes. Uh, oh, that's cool. Mm-hmm. Give me a good example of that. Do you remember someone's uh, of someone's cla- uh, of how someone updated my framing? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll have to think about that more. I mean, nowadays I just I stick to email threads. Uh, for example, I mean, we started about meditation, where someone talked, where someone talked about all my verbal games being similar to just. Um, pushing the button on the dashboard without actually doing the scene. And because a lot of times um, people who are heavy readers or people who, um, or uh, a lot of even academic people, they, they have a tendency to just try to describe everything in a way that makes it understandable without actually understanding the process itself. Ooh, okay. So what would that look like for, give us an example of when someone is just doing what you just said about not actually potentially put your push like uh, for example them. observing someone playing a video game and then describing it in the way of an anthropological sociological researcher versus actually do uh, actually playing it yourself and getting to the scene or same thing same things like um programming when you're just this you're just observing programmers rather than actually programming things yourself um or um mm. creating uh, creating huge elaborate social theories of how people interact uh, without interacting with the people themselves. So sometimes there, there isn't really any other option other than by going the data that you have. So what would you then recommend is a good balance to strike between the p- p- playing around with the, different, uh-huh. with the different buttons and also yeah. talking about the buttons? And um, so I think talking about, about the button can redirect attention to uh, ideally towards people, uh, towards say, um, uh, have it p- p- uh, playing with the buttons for people who have skin in the game. I like that. I like that point. So, so the more that you potentially talk about the the, the edge, let's say, of, yeah, of knowledge, yeah. the more people will be like, well, "Why is that interesting? I should maybe talk about." That yeah, more. I mean, it'll be interesting to talk to Nick to leave about it because he probably knows I a lot know. of people who are like, like him a lot. edgy, um, but then take off no skin in the game. Yep. Yep. So okay. So what about what about? Um, what about your thoughts on people that are edgy but don't have skin in the game? Tell us about that. Um, well, a lot of philosophers and academics are kind of like that, and they, they, they just write and write and write, and sometimes not without having even exact, exact access to feedback loops. Um, sometimes they just mm. publish, and because there's like, just, there's like an explosion of academic journals, there are more papers being published than their eyeballs, eyeballs to read them, or even any feedback loops that people are actually, say, updating favorably to what, uh, what they're publishing. Um, though uh, it, it does depend from uh, field to field uh, how the feedback loops act. Mm-hmm. 
and then okay so when you're uh, I when you've identified the uh, the individuals that you're working with how many people are you usually aiming to because I see as you interact oh, on yeah. your on your daily you're constantly um, task switching between reading and your yeah, different yeah, threads of yeah, people yeah. that you're playing this um, this game of edge tennis mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. how many uh, people are you playing edge tennis with oh probably like 20 plus a day um, I don't know about day maybe five to ten plus five to ten a day and 20 in like a in a week or something yeah yeah, yeah. probably interesting um, and then that is you would say one of the largest contributors to your intelligence um, hopefully in the long run yes yeah and then you want to use this sort of process that you're learning mm -hmm. about engaging with people in this edge tennis and you want to help other people see that as a as a strong way to expand one's intelligence yeah yeah okay and then what what is it like then for you to deal with different give me some examples of like someone that's really high on openness when uh -huh. you play tennis with them versus oh yeah someone that oh is high like, on openness is someone who basically tries all possible arrangements they don't they don't um they don't stick to the same patterns all the time they're willing to embarrass themselves or look foolish or suffer local losses in the process of trying to learn a better route or better route for themselves, even if it might not necessarily result in accelerated payoffs in the long run. Um, they could also, um, they also, uh, some of them have very good ability, they also like have strong attachment to the older game, so it allows them to discuss their older games with other people and, and, and tell them insights about their psych. Um, like they they basically they fundamentally like value they have they have intrinsic value of the, on their his, on their player history hmm oh gets i like how you mentioned that it's cool for them to kind of take a uh they're not scared to have an experience where they admit that they're wrong or that they have uh that they have to give up some sort of a a notion that the way that they saw the world in yeah. order for them to actually gain more uh-huh yeah that's a really important um okay and then what is it like potentially for you to to work with people at other level do you even do you even do you work with people that have low openness at all um i mean i interact with my parents <laughs> I know our older generations can sometimes be lower on openness. I know so. sometimes you can nudge them. In, sometimes you can nudge them in, in a little, little ways. Bit, in yeah, little in, ways. yeah. So, how old are the people that you would say are most on the open? Are you saying like twenty-five year olds? Is that kind of like um, your technically target? highest open? Highest openness people really are um, are young young kids and teenagers. Except society just somehow decides the best idea is to insulate them from everyone else, which prevents them from really op realizing their true openness, and then they just end up in those self-contained grades that aren't exactly good for, the, for personal development, but also like safety obsessiveness that happens over them too. That's right, yeah. But the, oh, anyway, that's beside the point. Um, in practice, people who are high openness, um, it's like, yeah, usually it's um, late teens to the 20s. And yeah. some, there are some who stay, stay that way even higher up. Interesting. And you know, we've talked about this a little bit before, and this is kind of relevant to what you were just saying about how there's uh, there's an overprotection that's going on with kids. There's the you know we were talking to Whitney about this earlier yeah. as well. Just the essence of 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 of, of controlling parenting rather than uh -huh. openness with parenting. Yeah, it's yeah, for, yeah. So and also, it's that. like this is also some related to people wanting to think they're right, especially like wanting to think. Do you think they're right when trying to protect their kids against when telling the kids, for example, don't go into the car, bad things will happen to you. It starts that's that's where it starts and then and then people get scared and they have vested interest in defending their fear, which is like defending one's own fear is one of the biggest impediments to societal progress. as we see also with what happened before is say gay marriage or weed mar legalization. Oh, interesting. So the 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 coddling of the mind mm -hmm. ends up making oh, yeah. it. Oh yeah, even like even in today's safety spaces, people have that interest in defending those safety spaces while actually trying to see the consequence of what happens if they you expose people to scenes that don't necessarily d directly hurt them. Yeah, it, we're, we, we got to build up the immune system to adversity, 
and to challenging of the way that we see the yeah, world. Yeah, and I think uh, uh, the problem is that a, a, lot of the, a lot of these things do need to be reframed in ways that are less threatening to people, and most people don't have the verbal agility to do, uh, to do clever reframings. Mm -hmm. This is like, like some, I saw in a science blog how someone said, in order to give feedback to, to these days, you have to acknowledge the person that's right in these, in these dimensions before actually giving them critical feedback. Oh my gosh, uh, that's such an interesting point because um, I've made it clear now that I don't mind however the feedback comes. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have a mentor that delivers. Oh yeah, you have to see the most vicious. And, and one, way to prepare <laughs> your, one way to prepare yourself for this is to just tell yourself that the, the person uh, could potentially be open to changing their mind about you in the future. It's just a local opinion that's held right now that can always change. And it is quite possible that if you listen to someone that's delivering you feedback in a way that to you may not be the most pleasing or uh -huh. comfortable. Uh -huh. Give people return chance, give people second chances. And not only that, but also just like look at them, even though they may be potentially coming coming uh -huh. at you, uh -huh. right, giving you that harsher critique, mm -hmm. but actually listen to every word they say because what they're saying is actually the most important truth that you need to hear. When someone's like looking at you and they're like, you know, you're power hungry, or you're like, you're overly greedy in these scenarios, or are you coming from a, an intent of, of malevolence in that scenario? And when they're challenging you in those ways and you're, and you, you're like, no, I'm not, and you like back away from, from, mm -hmm. from what they're saying, mm -hmm. you're not even reflecting. You can actually deeply take what they're saying and reflect on yourself and say, whoa, okay, maybe I actually am being a little greedy in this respect uh -huh. or regard. Yeah, and you can yeah. grow better. So yeah. you gotta get used to having feedback delivered in all kinds of ways. Yeah, yeah, no, I think a way that people are not used to having feedback delivered is because if, if someone says that, hey, maybe you should reframe your goals. A lot of people's goals, when you ask other people's life goals, they often reframe, they often frame their goals in ways that, that can be, they're frustratable and that may not necessarily be the most robust. Yep, and yep, yep. Um, getting people to reframe their goals in a different way uh, can be a way to, um, Get them, it makes them more receptive to feedback in the long run. But this tends to, is more likely for people who are not overly invested in, in the system. Yep. And this is, I, I want to mention this because, you know, you helped bring this to light for me. The idea of, um, of Bloom 2 Sigma specifically mm -hmm. ends up uh, having a one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentor. And this is actually something I mentioned about um, um, Tibetan Buddhism as well. Just the idea yeah, that yeah. the lineage is passed on from a teacher to a practitioner. Yeah. And I think that's a very exciting way. And it's now really, really proven that um, having that sort of a learning style to, puts you two standard deviations above someone that doesn't have that style of learning which is huge on the on a scale of growth um, now now that's why you pick this style of engagement with these with individuals is this one-on-one -on, -one on your edge I'm not sure if that's actually what I do you do a lot of groups as well yeah, is what yeah. you do yeah yeah and also I'm not very intense I'm very distributed rather than intense yeah yeah you are you are well you're multidisciplinary you're mm -hmm. not yeah, yeah yeah but you do have a focus on aging it's been something that you focused on. Um, yeah. Yeah. Also, just putting pushing that edge too. Hmm. Okay. So, okay. Let's let's see let's see where um, where some of these some of these questions get us. I've been I've been I've been investing a lot of of energy into figuring out how civilization got to where it has. Oh God, it's yeah. so weird. It's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go on. It is very weird. Yeah, it's super strange. Mm -hmm. Tell me why you think it's weird. Um, there are so many ways. Okay. I mean, you have the Fermi paradox and all that. Um, it's also like, I don't know. It's like, we also did it, even though, it, even though we have like such nasty cognitive algorithms, we're, we're so irrational on the massive scale. We're, it, it's like, 
a lot of the people in power are just like have throughout history have been legitimately shitty even but then uh, there's like technology technology progress happens anyways and people are not most very 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 few people are actually wise people who write history in fact tend to be a very very um non-representative sample of everyone in the world um and it's like the level of self-awareness in people even the smartest people is like so low even if you look like the, the smartest philosophers it's like there's a lot about life that they don't necessarily get that maybe some modern people get those were all so good okay there's I, re I remember when you said that history being written by only a small amount of people so did, there's so much that we didn't actually accurately keep as yeah, a record yeah. of how we got yeah here. and people because oftentimes um the value the valuation of a computer shop, people are not exactly rewarded for this. They don't necessarily see it as something that the makes market's good, not rewarding people yeah. for, for good things are not likely to happen to those who are historians of the internet or archivists or um or just people Jesus like, like even Gorn is not exactly as rich as he should be. Gorn G W E W G W E E R N. And that is again the Gorin.net, he's like someone, uh, he's like very, very methodical in his observations of um, basically like uh, emerging trends in the top 20 years. And he's very open about himself in a way that most other people are not open about. Like it, it, does it does take a very high a degree of openness yeah. in order to be a reliable uh, historian or narrator. Well, we're constantly wanting your perspective to be enhanced by new information and being open to it being yeah, enhanced. Yeah, I find it very weird that we have yet to fully come to the realization that we all evolved on this rock together and we're still having issues with greed and war and poverty and we're just we have so much abundance but we're so caught up in power controls that we're we forget about how to figure out the long term how to slow down oh yeah yeah power and control those those stupid power dynamics battles that people play with each other like with parents and children for example um where it becomes insufferable to stay with them because of the the constant need the constant need for control or something or like obedience or yeah, yeah. Oh, um, you highly recommend a path uh, of, of of around what age of like eighteen or so, taking a path of like maybe exploring some metropolises or going away from your nest. Oh, the earlier the better, but yeah. Well, you can't really. Can you go pre eighteen? It's kind of look at Tarshida Rara. Okay, what time does she leave the nest? Uh, she left at sixteen. Sixteen. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We can. We we can be down with uh, with helping young people um, uh, find places in metropolises to go out and start surrounding themselves with like scientists and engineers and artists and different thought leaders. That would be fun. Entrepreneurs. Yeah, I like that. Young people getting out there. Um, okay. We talked a bit about the weirdness. Um, how about what? What about what transcends? this reality what exists outside of the 3d reality um there are many many theories about this a lot of speculation about it um i know so many people who are like obsessed with this question it's like it becomes their singular obsession and what are your thoughts um there are a lot of there are a lot of like loops that people, lot, thought loops or like memes that people are attracted to. Like people, when people say they, they see aliens in DMT, I'm not actually sure if I believe them. It's just a meme that <laughs> easily propagates. It's, somewhat, it's easily interpreted that, that somehow some people find easy to believe, which actually makes it less believable. Mm -hmm. now, now, is there some sort of a greater power that made this Big Bang happen? Um... I, at this point, I don't necessarily 
have a good educated guess on this at all. Okay. And what have been some of the things that you've been studying at the edge that you think you want to share with people right now that maybe less that the people don't really know too much about or haven't been studying too much? I think a lot of times people even edge, um, I think edgy ways of being super open to the world of like publishing all raw data rather than just publish it. What then? What goes in academic papers? Um, also, ways. Um, also, people tell me, tell me that it's not just semantic knowledge uh, that I should go for. It's also like some sort of experiential knowledge, um, like uh, uh, oftentimes the type type that easily. Um, that's even more like one person told me, Alex, what I, I, I would be fascinated to see what happened to you if you just went for six months in Indonesia, in Java, and then just surfed all uh, the surf for that period of time. It might change your internal lived experience so much that, um, it, that in a way that, uh, say, affects everything in the future in a good, maybe in a good way. If Alex went to Java, <laughs> for six months yeah. and surfed. Yeah. I, I, yeah, that breath that you just took, I think that may happen at a little deeper scale. I think you, you may have a potentially a more, uh, potentially a more, a way of seeing reality, yeah. a potentially a slower uh, earth connect, connecting to earth. Yeah, I, yeah, level. yeah. I know yeah. someone else who, uh, a good friend who just went to India for like a month and stayed away from the standard academia and Silicon Valley and bubbles. And social bubble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah. Of that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And even if you just go for a month, yeah, and come back, I think it will be quite a, an enriching experience for you. It also depends on what you do. Oh, yeah, totally. You just go and hang out internet cafes on social media. It's not, what is that? Uh -huh. like, right. But, um, <clears throat> okay, how about, what would you say is the central guiding principle of your life? Um, stay relevant. As in staying relevant so you stay relevant for yourself or for society to see you as someone that is a beacon at the edge? Both, uh, both are relevant. Both or are like relevant, some, yeah. some, someone to pay attention to or, or good things will happen if, if they, if you pay a little bit more attention to X or even give them resources and see what, what X does makes use of those resources. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I feel similarly about that too. Yeah. Some people That's think cool. I can be an ad alloc optimal ad resource allocator given my huge knowledge base. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. also like sometimes insane memory of certain people. And what do you what do you take of the uh, ethical quandaries that civilization is facing with exponential technology and geopolitics? Um, state dependent. I do think um, a lot of these are like fundamentally confused. I think people don't exactly have a clear, precise understanding of what consent means or what their long-term preferences really are. And I'm not sure if a lot of people are even capable of formulating these because it takes massive imagination to formulate these, especially in a world that turns out different from one that you have any imagination to, to perceive of whatsoever. Ooh, ooh, that's good. So it's as though we've had the imagination kind of sucked out of us due to the conformity that's occurring in many ways. But that imagination is so crucial for us to envision a world that can have these ethical quandaries more easily oh, solved. Oh yeah, for example, look at what happened to Indian tribes after the, after the Europeans invaded mm -hmm. their lands. The question is, are you going to stake your old ways or are you going to adjust to their ways? Of course, it's more complicated than that because some of them do encounter legitimate discrimination when trying to adopt to white ways. But in general, if if you're if you want to if you want to stay robust yourself, it, it's probably better to accept what change happens and um, make the best out of it, and not hold to a strong identity. Yeah. Very interesting, Alex. So, do you have another thought that comes to mind that you think would be important to share in this conversation that we're having? Um. Let me think here. I had a lot of thoughts yesterday, but my mind got wiped earlier today. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I installed my air pollution meter, and holy shit, I really need to take the Alex NO2 has been door. obsessing over his air pollution yeah, meter yeah. today. It's actually a it's very... It's yellow in here. I actually it's bought green it, in here. Yeah, I bought it three months ago, and for whatever reason, I didn't even try to start using it until recently. And yeah. this is like a massive failure mode in my part. Um, There's also just a massive failure mode in my part, because, you know, th those air scenes have 30-day return periods. So really, um, if you're feeling stuffed, Stuffy or whatever, just get one of those because th those are the scenes that improve quality of life more than anything else. Actually, Alex, and your lived experience. And your lived experience. Alex brings up a very good point. There is that we 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 only really read rarely about these, like oh, the you know parts per million of some particulate in Mumbai or Beijing is sort of extremely high, and uh, or in the Bay Area when we had the fire, and then LA and whatnot. Yeah. That there was a high part amount of particulate that we shouldn't be inhaling and whatnot. But in our living spaces, in these homes that the air quality inside of a home is much different than outside. Yeah. Outside you have much more fresh air yeah. than you do inside a home. And especially if you're cooked, if you're baked in, the heat's all the way on, there's people that are farting, sneezing, coughing, like on an airplane as well, the air quality on an airplane. There's like, there's, you know, the air quality in a car. There's all these sort of different ways of measuring the air quality and I'm glad that you really tie in the importance of remembering that your lived experience when you're on a beach and you're inhaling fresh from the ocean or from the sea, that air, you can like feel more alive. You feel a lot better. And so it's important to, to keep that in mind. That's a good point. Um, I think another, um, another thing that that you, um, you know, that you care a lot about is the optimization of learning. Um, and, you know, we talked about being at the edge and optimizing your own learning and other people's learnings. Um, what would be your recommendation to young, young people and also um, adults as well? But what is the, what is a central principle that, they, that people can adopt in order to optimize their learning? Um, for one thing, if you're going to learn about scenes, I, um, don't think of yourself as a competition to learn calculus at the earliest age possible, but rather um, the, the, the most important things to learn first are basically health-related, experiential, um, memorize the glycemic index, food, indexes of all the major foods, um, try to get a, blood, a continuous blood glucose monitor to see how you respond to certain foods. Um, it's like also the lived experience, get a lux meter to figure out to, uh, to measure uh, the light spectrum of your houses, to see, um, and also um, get the fastest computer you can possible. Um, oftentimes, I've learned that for example, getting Amazon Prime is just easier. It's just, it's better to be impulsive on the scenes that um, uh, like Amazon Prime uh, that allow you to be less impulsive on other scenes, because the, most people's uh, attention bandwidth is limited. And um, you basically want to um, set things up early on so you're free things up earlier and also get reliable note-taking devices later on so you can. And also use Gmail or your Amazon Facebook as much as possible. At least this is what I do because it's, those messenger threads are just much easier searchable than later. Um, aggressively use archive that is on, um, on content you think might get deleted in five years um, because uh, there is a lot of good stuff online that isn't that gets deleted and it's a tragic and then people and then that causes people to not remember what scenes were like say, 10 years ago yeah thank goodness for the internet way back it's machine, yeah. underperforming uh, yeah but it's so difficult to archive everything at ever that's ever been posted and collected um, but that brings up a, a good point that, that, that you mentioned and you mentioned a bunch of other good ones they're kind of like increase your day-to-day -day lived experience with your health um, Okay. Yeah, also I know that learning rates are much faster if you have, let's say, roommates who you tolerate very well because they, they know things about you and you, you, you remember and their memory can build up in really amazing ways, especially, especially because like your mem human, human brains are human brains and because human brains human brains to remember stuff about other people and their preference is much better than they can remember, say, most abstract thought. Because uh, when the person gives you a context, it, it also allows um, someone, if you're tired, you also have someone to rely, um, that, that you can rely on or whatever. Mm -hmm. Alex, this has been a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Thanks again for coming mm -hmm. on to the show and yeah, talking to yeah. us. Yeah, this has been, a, I like our conversation about optimized learning and the edge of knowledge and then working on playing the games of tennis to kind of scrape further past mm -hmm. the edge. It's exciting stuff. 
Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Let us know what you're thinking. Uh, also, we would love for you to build, go create, manifest your destiny. Into yeah, so another thing about edginess I would like to mention is that I think living in places like Boston and San Francisco allow you access to a huge number of smart slash highly open people. And in the in the background of knowing a huge amount of people, that is, is the speed of your learning rate in, in, a, in a really interesting way because, I mean, people are better at learning facts about other humans than um, than they are and still learning things themselves. And then you, you can basically get estimates, rough estimates of base, um, even uh, oftentimes the, the things that people say before they're about to, about to partake in the project and this, or the context, which then allows you to form basically estimates of, say, the chance of succeeding in a startup later on or what exactly they might be missing out, um, missing out before starting out the startup. Yep. The Alex's point there is so crucial. You see things as a topology of competence and influence. A lot of the people at the peaks of those topologies exist in metropolises like Boston and San Francisco and New York and LA and whatnot. So to go and move out to these areas and go and surround yourself with these other brilliant leaders and go and play these games of tennis at the edges with them is just going to rock you forward so much. Yeah, basically, dense, uh, the survival advantage given, uh, uh, given, given in dense social environments, especially when you are in them when you're when you're super, super young and yeah. grow with them oh gosh you're yeah, getting in there when you're young 16 18 great ages to get in um, um even earlier is better even at 12 yeah get in there young yeah get in there young and start tinkering start tinkering much love go and build the future manifest your destiny into mm -hmm. the world everyone we'll see you soon peace okay bye bye